Welcome back to Paul's Tech News. It was one month ago now in the most excellent September 25th Tech News episode that I warned you all of an oncoming storm. And indeed, it was a mighty and unrelenting tempest that assailed us all these past four weeks, starting with Gale Force AMD CPU launches that led into an Intel Arc GPU monsoon, which was followed by a furious flurry of NVIDIA 4090s and culminated in the 13th gen Raptor Lake CPU polar vortex, I suppose, if I want to ride that analogy into the ground. It's too soon for a mom joke there, I think, but the point is, it's been a long journey that went by in a flash, and there was an overwhelming amount of benchmark data published, and the dust definitely has not settled yet. Some weathered the storm with stalwart stoicism, but others fell by the wayside. So now we take a moment to honor those who were lost along the way. Hail the victorious dead. Excellent. Today's video is brought to you by Kyoxia's ever-expanding family of high-performance SSDs, featuring their latest VIX 3D flash memory. The XG8 Client M.2 SSD is now available in capacities up to 4 terabytes, with up to 7 gigabytes per second sequential read speeds, and for enterprise or hyperscale data center use, consider the CD8, which supports PCI Express 5.0, or the XD7P, which leverages the thermal and performance benefits of the E1.S form factor, ideal for pairing with the latest AMD Epic or Intel Xeon server hardware. For more on Kyoxia SSDs, click the sponsor link in the video description. Intel's answer to AMD's Ryzen 7000 series launch arrived Thursday this week, with reviews and retail sales going live on the same day, although pre-orders for the new 13th gen Intel CPUs, the 13900K and KF, 13700K and KF, and 13600K and KF have been available on Newegg for a couple weeks already. Videocards.com has a list up with more than 50 independent reviews, and those are mostly for the 13900K and 13600K since those are the two chips that Intel sent out review samples for. I honestly do not know why they don't seem to like reviewers getting an early look at the middle chip, which is the 13700K for this generation, but there are a few outlets that got their hands on all three. But even those that did, like computerbase.de, got a sample via another source than Intel. Hence the engineering sample trim and the redacted serial number here to hide those tracks. To summarize the results and sentiments from the reviewing community though, in terms of pure performance, the Raptor Lake CPUs are all quite impressive, with the 13900K offering 30 to 50% better performance in compute tasks versus the 12900K, and all three chips providing improved gaming performance over AMD's 7000 series and the 5800X3D. The results are less rosy when efficiency and operating temperature results are factored factored in too though, as the 13900K in particular was heavily criticized for hitting 100 degrees Celsius within seconds when running a test like Cinebench, even with a 360 or 420 millimeter all-in-one liquid cooler, while pulling well over 300 watts just for the CPU. A power draw rating you might very well confuse with a high-end graphics card and a step in the wrong direction, even compared to Intel's power-hungry 12th gen CPUs. Fortunately, the 13700K and 13600K are much more reasonable in terms of power draw and temperatures, while still maintaining a measurable 10% or so lead in CPU-limited game tests, although they still can't match AMD's 7700X or 7600X when it comes to efficiency. This results in an actual difficult decision to make if you're trying to decide between the two platforms, with pure performance at any cost PC builders likely leaning towards Intel's 13900K despite the heat and power draw, mid-budget gamers perhaps eyeing the 13600K's nice balance of excellent gaming performance and actually decent compute chops too, and anyone with an eye towards optimizing their power bill or thinking of long-term upgrades investing in the AM5 platform and one of AMD's Ryzen 7000 series chips. And also a bunch of gamers just thinking the new CPUs with their increased platform and DDR5 costs aren't worth it at all and just grabbing a 5800X 3D instead. Oh, and there was just one other thing. AMD has held the CPU frequency world record since August 2014, a mostly meaningless title since the 8.7 GHz record was achieved with an otherwise horrible FX 8370 processor, but one that they like to use to poke fun at Intel with occasionally anyway. 
Well, no more cheeky AMD marketing reps, because the 13900K has toppled your precious record, pushed to 8.81285 GHz by overclocker Elmore on an ASUS ROG Maximus Z790 Apex motherboard, as posted to HardwareBot on Thursday. But just as Intel's CPUs were flaunting their newly minted benchmark results across the internet on Thursday, pressing AMD's defenses at the cliff's edge in dramatic fashion, Team Red seemed to smile and say, there's something I ought to tell you. I am not left-handed, because like clockwork, a conveniently timed rumor appeared on Raptor Lake launch day. Remember the 3D vCache technology that is allowing the 5800X 3D to perform so well in gaming? Yeah, they can add that to the Ryzen 7000 series CPUs too. And apparently, we'll find out more about that at CES in January 2023, which is only about 10 or 11 weeks from now if WCCF Tech's sources are genuine. The processors will be positioned as the fastest gaming chips on the market, and will be taking the gaming performance crown from Intel's Raptor Lake 13th Gen CPUs, says Hassan, adding that two CPUs might be in the works, one for enthusiasts and one for mainstream gaming. I could see this going a few different ways. The 5800X 3D is a single CCD chip, so if they stick to that, we could see a 7600X 3D and or a 7700X 3D or 7800X 3D, but I'm curious if they can get 3D vCache working well with a 2CCD processor like the 7900X or 7950X to produce the ultimate all-around performance champion. 7000X 3D chips will likely run at slightly lower clock speeds like the 5800X 3D did though, but AMD might be a bit more flexible with overclocking and voltage restrictions this time around. For anyone who wasn't sold on the CPUs launched in the past month though, this could be a good reason to hold off on that new build just a little bit longer. Another reason to wait might be to hold out for better prices, and if this story is any indication, AMD might be pushed towards offering some sales sooner rather than later. Demand for the Ryzen 7000 series CPUs is not holding up, according to WCCF Tech, again, who says they got a hold of an internal memo and AMD will be reducing chip production to avoid an oversupply situation. The 7900X was their best seller so far, the article says, based on global shipments and retail numbers, but further adoption of the AM5 platform has been hampered by high motherboard prices, with nothing close to AMD's promised $125 B650 boards appearing, as well as higher DDR5 prices and their own 5800X 3D providing game-focused builders with a less expensive alternative. But AMD is likely hoping that their other late 2022 hardware debut, the RDNA 3-powered Radeon 7000 series of GPUs, won't suffer the same fate. But since all those other CPU and GPU launches are done with now, there's a slight increase in early info with the next-gen Radeons, starting with a more specific unveiling date. It's still Thursday, November 3rd, but now we know the time, 4 p.m. Eastern, when they'll be kicking off a live stream on their YouTube channel, and in yet another article from WCCF Tech, a supposed internal source from AMD shared that the 7900 XT would be among the GPUs announced. Although it won't be the top model in this stack, that will likely be the 7950 XT, the informant claims the 7900 XT will feature 20 gigabytes of GDDR6 VRAM and may exceed expectations although your expectations may vary based on which early leaks and rumors you think are most accurate. A 20 gigabyte VRAM configuration is apparently a step down from the 24 gigabyte allocation originally expected, but perhaps the 7950 XT will still get 24 gigs, so it can match up with the almost inevitable RTX 4090 Ti, while the 7900 XT takes on the RTX 4090. Launch dates for whatever new cards are announced are still up in the air. My money is on a debut later in November, although other leaks have pointed towards December. WCCF Tech has a nice chart up with the rumored specs accumulated for comparison, and you can find a link to this article and all the articles from today's video in the video description. And now we delicately segue over to tech briefs where the news is bite-sized and easy to digest. Echoes of last week's RTX 4090 launch are still reverberating around the tech world, and if you listen closely, you can hear the voices say, it's too expensive. And indeed, while PC gamers with a trust fund rejoiced in the ability to buy a bunch more frames per second, the budget-minded quickly grew weary of being pitched cards that cost 1600 bucks at minimum with AIB cards going for even more. MSI was called out for the apparently shady move to list their AIO water-cooled Supreme Liquid X RTX 4090 for 1,750 bucks originally, only to increase the price 11% to $1,935 on their website store just days later, resulting in
opinion reviews like mine, potentially judging the card based on the lower $1,750 retail price versus what they intended. But MSI responded Wednesday, apologizing for the error and even taking responsibility, stating it was our negligence to mismatch the price. They'll be refunding the difference to buyers who scooped it up at the higher price. And thankfully, it sounds like I won't have to take down my review or put a special note in there or anything. If anyone is unhappy with the massive brick-like coolers that most RTX 4090s ship with though, Fanless Tech posted a potential solution on Friday. First look at an aftermarket air cooler from Raijin Tech, the Morpheus 8069, expected to be unveiled on November 1st. It's compatible with a range of RTX 30 series and Radeon 6000 series GPUs, as well as the RTX 4090. It can dissipate 360 watts of heat passively in a system with decent airflow, and presumably more than that if you slap a couple decent 120 millimeter fans onto it. No word on pricing yet, but given all the pre-launch fears about the RTX 4090 drawing 600 watts of power and causing house fires, it's amusing to see a potential fanless cooling solution available for it already. Although I imagine you'd have to underclock and undervolt it just a smidge. Finally, we have some good news about USB version names. They will suck slightly less now, thanks to some updates with USB 4.0. Specifically, USB 4.0 version 2, and I know USB 4 version 2 sounds way too close to USB 3.2 Gen 2 by 2 or whatever it was called, but hear me out. The USB Implementers Forum no longer recommends that vendors use pointless terms like super speed or even USB 3.2 Gen 2 by 2, but instead that they use labels like these. It says USB, and then it says the bandwidth. Brilliant! Or USB, and then the bandwidth, and then the wattage supported. Also both simple and useful designations. Now, unfortunately, the USB IF can't force all vendors to use these labels, so we're a long way from things being ideal, but hopefully the labeling catches on and savvy consumers shun brands who don't adopt it. Oh, and the USB 4 V2 spec also supports 80 gigabits per second bi-directional bandwidth or one-way data transfers at up to 120 gigabits per second. A big jump to meet the needs of high refresh rate 4K HDR gaming displays, since DisplayPort 2.1 can be piped through now, as well as high-speed external SSDs or even graphics cards. The only downside is that they just published this spec on Tuesday, so products that can actually make use of it won't be out for 12 to 18 months. But you won't have to wait 12 to 18 months for more videos from me. No, I'll be back next week with regular content and the tech news as always. That is all for this week though, so if you liked this video, click that like button or leave me a comment down below. While you're down there, all the articles I talked about today are linked in the description if you're interested. You can also check out my store at paulsharbor.net for high quality merchandise, t-shirts, hoodies, beer sets, and more, including my awesome new 8-bit designs. Subscribing to my channel is always a good call too. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you next week.